Hey, what's up? In this episode, I wanted to talk about Ruby blocks, procs, and lambdas, uh, and just go through a bunch of things about blocks, procs, and lambdas that I think might be useful as you're writing some Ruby code. So this will be for a beginner Rubyist. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's just jump in. So a block is the that sort of bit of code that usually starts with a curly brace or starts with a do end. If you've ever used an array um, and the each method on an array, then you have used a block before. Um, so let's just let's just get a, a little array here going. So I'm going to say uh, maybe we have a list of students: Grayson, uh, Logan, Steve and Tony or something like this, right? And then if we wanted to like loop over those students and print out their names, we could say students uh, dot each, and then we could use the curly brace. Um, and we could say puts student like this. Uh, and so the part of this, this line here that is the block is the part that starts with the curly brace, the curly brace and ends with the curly brace here. Now, if we were to run this code, we're gonna see that it prints out Grayson, Logan, Steve, and Tony. Now the each method, so the each method is a method on array, and that each method accepts a block as an argument. The same way that we would call maybe like students dot, um, or maybe you have you maybe you have some method that's like do something and you wanted to pass it, uh, you know, the numbers one, two, and three as arguments, one, two, and three here are arguments to the do something method. A block itself is also an argument. So you could actually write do something in Ruby without the parens and it would pass these arguments to the do something method. The same way um, we are passing a block. Now we can only pass one block using the block syntax to a method. Technically you can pass multiple different little bits of code that can run inside of a method if you wanted to, but you would need to pass at least one of them as a, um, or uh, only at, at most one of them could be a block, passed as a block just like this. So um, what I wanna do now is I can rewrite this block that we're passing to each as a do end statement. And we want the body of the block to be inside and usually indented, it should be indented. Now in practice, um, if if you have a multi-line block, so if we're gonna say like puts student dot um, length or something like that, maybe like the length of the student's name, we could do this. Now um, the the variable name here is kind of like an argument that you would pass to a function. So when we say do end or those curly braces, it's almost like we're defining a function in, in that we are defining a little bit of code that we want to run for every single instance of a student, um, in this case, when we're, when we're talking about each. Now this little block of code is almost like a function. It's not a function and it works differently than a function, um, but it's kind of like a bit of code that you want to run. And this part here is similar to a function's arguments. So between these, we call these pipes, between the um, these like vertical bars here, this is the, the list of arguments. Now there's some blocks that can accept multiple arguments. So for instance, each with index, accepts a block that takes multiple arguments. So we can say student and we can say I, which will give us like which number student that is. So if we say like puts I, that will give us the index in the student's array. Uh, each with index, oh, I'm missing an X here. Each with index. Okay, so this is giving us the index into the array as we iterate over it. So this is, these are going to be sort of the arguments to the block. Now let's talk about how this is actually implemented under the hood, right? How can we write our own method that accepts a block? Well, if we wanted to, we could say like def each um, here, we can make our own method called each, and maybe it takes as the first argument, the array, and as the second argument, it's gonna take the block that we wanna execute on the array. Now there's a couple of helpful, um, things that we can do inside of here, but let's just look at what we might do. So the each method inside of students, um, I'm gonna implement it without using the underlying arrays each method, just so that we can look at how it might be implemented. We're gonna use a while loop because that's like a more primitive way of iterating over a list of things. So let's say i is equal to zero, and then we're gonna say while i is less than array.count, uh, we're gonna say i plus equals one. So we're gonna increment i, and then we wanna do something inside of this, right? So if we wanted to, we could just say puts, like I'm in the array, or like I'm iterating, right? Um, and if we call each here, 
and we pass in the first argument being students. And uh, for now, let's just pass let's just pass in students, and we'll say that our each method just takes an array as an argument. Now, if we were to uh, to run this block, we see I'm iterating, I'm iterating, I'm iterating. So it's going to run this while loop is going to run four times. That's correct because this array of students has four elements inside the array. And it's going to start off with zero. So i is going to be uh, zero at the top of this while loop. And then it will be incremented to one. Then it'll be two. Then it'll be three. Then it'll be four. So let's actually print out what i is also. Um, so i is equal to, and then we'll say i, just so that we can see what i is as we're iterating. Okay, so we've got i is zero, one, two, three. So we can actually use i to index into the array and get out the element. So we'll say the element is array at index i. And that will give us the, um, the element also. So we can say L is equal to, and then we'll just print out L. Okay, so this is gonna give us what the element is at that, uh, at that index in the array. So here we see like um, at index zero, the element is equal to Grayson. So now we have L is equal to Grayson. Then at index one, it's equal to Logan, so on and so forth. Okay, so now we have a method that at least can sort of like loop over an array. But at this point, our each method does not accept a block argument. So the first thing that we can do is explicitly pass in a block argument, and it's gonna start with this ampersand. That ampersand is gonna do a special thing. It's gonna convert a block into a proc. So when we pass in a block down here, we're gonna say each students do student, and then we'll say uh, puts student, and so this block here is going to be this bit of code. So this bit of code between the do and end is a block. We're passing that as a block and we put the, this, uh, this ampersand or pretzel looking thing in front of it so that it converts it into a proc. And a proc is something that has methods that we can call. So um, what we wanna do now is say block.call and we're gonna pass in the element itself. So I'm gonna remove that put statement. And so this block.call is going to execute and pass the element. So recall that this element here is going to be the, uh, the student, right? So it's going to call the block. So block.call means like execute this thing, right? And element here is going to be the student. So for the very first time we go through this while loop, element is going to be Grayson. And that element is gonna be passed as an argument into this block. And we'll be able to reference, whoops, we'll be able to reference the element by using the student name here because this is the, uh, the parameter or the block parameter, sort of like the name of the parameter that we're accepting. And we're gonna print that out. Um, so let's give that a whirl. So we'll say uh, Ruby blocks.rb. And now we see Grayson, Logan, Steve, and Tony. So that is executing our block that we passed as an argument to the each method. Okay, so this is one way that you can do it. I like doing it this way, um, using this explicit block argument. However, there is an alternative, and that is to use the yield keyword. Yield, uh, why? Okay, so instead of passing the block argument explicitly, I'm gonna say yield, and then uh, I'm gonna pass the element like so. Now, this will also work. It's just an alternative um, to the block argument. I, I think yield is probably a little faster, if I recall correctly but I like using the block argument because it's explicit. You can see, the, uh, like when, it, when it's written with yield, you have to read through the entire method body in order to identify that this method accepts a block. If you didn't know that this method accepted a, uh, a block uh, or that you didn't, if you didn't see the yield method then, or the yield called here, the yield keyword, then you might not actually know that this method accepts a block. So if um, there's also an, another helpful, sort of underlying method that you can use, and that is block given. So you can say, um, if block given, then we're, we wanna like run all this stuff. So maybe if like no block was given, we can put like no block given, and then we can return early. Okay, so if we were to just call each without any block down here, um, we're just gonna call each with students, then this block given question mark method is like a built-in thing that will check to see if there was a block passed or not. And so here we can see that no block was given. This allows you to say like, um, you, can, you can add like default functionality that will say if there was a block, then do like execute the block and get the default value. If there was no block, then don't do, or you know, you can, you can basically like build in defaults 
um, that can fork based on whether or not a block was actually passed in. Okay, so, um, all right, so we've got a block, we've got our block arguments and we're, we're, we've seen yield. Let's also go back to um, passing in the block here. We'll remove our checks at the top and we'll, we'll go back to block.call. Um, okay, this is, all, this is all great. Now, let's take a look at procs. So a proc, proc.new, is another way to just create a block of code that will accept some arguments and can run and do stuff. So if we were to say like proc.new um, student, and then we could say puts student, right? Like this is a very simple proc. And here we might say like print, uh, like print block or something is equal to this, or print, print proc. <laughs> um, and then here, what we could do is say students, and then I believe we can say ampersand print proc, and that will convert it from a proc to a block, pass it as the block argument, and then it'll convert it back to a proc before it runs. So we can run this and um, we get back Grayson, Logan, Steve. So the, the, there's not very many differences between the two. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. So there is, so this is one way that you can, you can create a block independent of where the method is called. So you could create a proc like much high at some higher level and store that off into a constant. And that's going to be some little block of code that you want to pass around and use frequently. Um, you might use a proc for that. An alternative is to use a Lambda. So you can use a Lambda, which is a special version of a proc. And we can use, um, we can use the, uh, the arrow keyword here and student. This looks a little differently. Um, and I believe this should also work. Yep, so this is the same same sort of deal, but we use the arrow keyword instead, or we can use lambda, lambda, the lambda keyword, and I believe this will also work. So lambda and the arrow, the arrow format are another way. The difference between a lambda and a proc is in uh, there's a couple there's a couple different um, there's a couple differences. Number one, a lambda is stricter about the number of arguments that are passed. So right now our block is only being called with one, or our proc or whatever is being only called with one element. So if our Lambda expected two arguments here, so if we said like student and I, then this is gonna fail because it's getting it's receiving the wrong number of arguments. A Lambda is more like uh, an anonymous function that's being defined than it is um, a a proc or a block of code. So a Lambda's first difference from a block is that it's more strict about the number of arguments. The second, uh, the second difference with a Lambda is how it handles the return keyword. So if we are, uh, let's see, we're, we're back to normal. This is working again. You can actually say like, uh, let's make this do, um, and, and then we'll return student. So we can return a student from a Lambda, and that's what will be actually returned uh, when this thing is called here. So let's say that like we have like our, um, yeah, anyways, that, let's say we have our uh, value is equal to this, and then we can say puts val down here. So we're gonna, we're gonna print out the students and we're also gonna print out the value. So right now we're getting duplicates of all of them. If we don't have a return statement there, um, then we're just getting back nil because we're not ex actually like returning anything from the from the lambda. Um, but if we made this into a proc, then it's going to implicitly return the last statement. So if we go back to proc uh, proc dot new do, and then this is going to say student. Then we should get something different here. Um, in that, if we say return inside of the proc or inside of a block, it's going to return out of the context in which the block was defined. So if we say return student, this is gonna try to return from main. It's gonna like try to return out of this, out of, uh, out of this scope here. So this is gonna fail because you can't return out of main. I thought it's gonna return. Oh, right, okay, so this is, this is, um... right, okay. So this is returning the student, which is putting the value, and it's also returning out of the execution because it does not want to um, continue the execution of main. So we're, we're calling each dot students, we're calling each students, um, and it's returning out of that function 
after seeing the first student. So this is like a way to like break out of a loop, right? So if you were saying, um, uh, if we go back to our, our, our example above, right? So one thing that you could do is as you're iterating over students, you could say like, if student equals Steve, like return, right? Or return if student is equal to Steve, this return statement would break out of the enclosing function. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> uh, okay, so the last, I think we've gone over blocks, procs, and lambdas at like the basic level. There's a couple other things that I wanted to show though. Um, yeah, so let's, let's just uh, remove this. All right, so the next thing I wanted to demonstrate is that you can write a method that will execute a block multiple times. So I'm gonna say def um, do thrice. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna accept a block here. And inside of our do thrice method, we will just execute block.call, block.call, and block.call. And so it will do something three times uh, when we call, when we pass it a block. So we can now say do thrice, and if we say do, um, I don't know, maybe it doesn't take any arguments and we'll just say puts, like say hello. Now when we execute this function, we're passing the block and it can actually execute the block several times. So now we can say like, uh, say hello and it will run that block three different times. Um, similarly, you can do the same thing with yield, uh, but this, yeah, this can be interesting to encounter the first time that you see it is it's actually like yielding several different times. Another thing that's interesting is that you can, um, in the same way that you can sort of do argument destructuring in the, um, in the parameter list for a function. So if we had a, a method here called pair and we wanted to pass it in a tuple or some sort of like two element array here, maybe we have like X and Y, um, and we're just gonna say puts X and puts Y. This is gonna be a pair of items. Maybe we just wanna like print out the pair of items and we can say pair and we can pass it an array of one and two, right? And now when we pass one and two, those will be destructured because we're using these parentheses here, um, like a double set of parentheses. This inner set of parentheses and using X and Y is going to look at this array and it's gonna destructure the, uh, the array into elements X and elements Y. And so one will be assigned to X and two will be assigned to Y. So let's take a look at how that works. So now we have one and two. So it's printing out one and two. And just to kind of like drive this issue home, let's make Z another thing over here. And maybe we'll pass like three and four as arguments to our pair function. And now we'll see, oh, let's actually also print out uh, Z um, so we can see what this looks like. So we can see that like X and Y were still attached to one and two and it just discarded or didn't care about three. So three wasn't, uh, we didn't have a third, um, a third parameter that we were destructuring into. Uh, and then it, it knew that passing four was actually like the second argument because we're, the first argument is this array that's being destructured into this first parameter. And the second argument was a four that's being destructured into, or not destructured, but assigned to Z. So now we see one, two, and four as our X, Y, and Z. Similarly, we can do sort of the same thing with blocks. Okay, so if you have a if you have an array, maybe we have our students here and they're they're actually tuples where it's like their name and also like their score on a test. Okay, so now we have an, a 2D array where we have their name and we have their score on a test. Um, and what we're gonna do is say like 72 and uh, this be, uh, eight, this eight. Eight. Tony Stark is pretty smart. All right, so our students, now as we iterate over our students, there's gonna be two, two arguments there, okay? So we can, we can do like uh, students.each do, and now if we wanted to, um, each student is gonna be an, an array, right? Like the elements of students, each of the elements of students is an array. So if we wanted to, we could say like student array, right? And then if we p student array, then we're gonna get back that array object because that was like an element of it, right? Uh, did I miss a comma? I did. Okay, let's see. All right, try this again. All right, so we've got the elements of the array. Fantastic, but we could also destructure as part of our arguments to this block here. So we can say like student comma grade and that will give us those, those elements destructured into the student and grade. So we can say, print the student and then also print the grade. 
and that will give us uh, those separate values. So this is how we can sort of like break it out into individual arguments. That can be handy as you're like iterating over different weird combinations of things. Um, yeah, so another way that blocks are commonly used is when you're initializing instances of things. So um, for like lazily inst instantiating something. So for instance, like uh, if you wanted to initialize a an array or let's let's talk about the, the hash the hash version first. So if we wanted to have like a histogram of um, uh, where we're like counting up the instances of something, let's say these are gonna be responses to a questionnaire where you could enter in like between one and five. So let's say answers is equal to this list and it's just gonna be a list of people's responses. So we've got some ones, we've got some twos, we've got some uh, uh, fives and other threes. And what we want to do is count up the instances of how many how many people answered one, how many people answered two, how many people answered five, how many people answered three. And so we might say answers dot each do uh, answer, and then we can say count or like if counter at answer or like that has key uh, answer, then we can say counter at answer plus equals one else counter at answer is equal to one, right? So this will give us like a way to sort of um, check to see if, so the counter is an empty hash right now. And when we encounter the first element of the first answer, right, number one, we wanna see if counter has the key of one. And if it does, then we're gonna increment the count. If it does not, then we want to um, create a brand new key inside of the hash with the value of one. And then we'll print out, um, maybe we'll say like puts counter at the end here. All right, so let's take a look. So we've got one one, uh, four twos, one five, and three twos. So that is, that's correct, right? That's exactly what we want. But another common example for using a block or passing a block as an argument is to use it as a way to lazily instantiate something. And so hash, there is a way to initialize a brand new hash uh, and pass a block to the new function, so hash.new, uh, where we can pass in some arguments here, the, the underlying hash itself and a key that we've never seen before. And we can say that the hash at that key value is equal to zero. Okay, so this is going to say that like, if I index into counter with a key that I've never seen before, then it's going to create that key and set it equal to zero. So if we were to like actually just pull up pry here and say maybe counter is equal to hash.new and we pass it this block, that accepts two arguments. It accepts as the first argument, the hash, and as the second argument, the key that was never found before. And then we can use that key to index into the hash and set that equal to zero. Then we get back a counter object and we can say like counter at maybe like A or something. And that will now say counter. If we look at counter, now it has like added A as a key into counter. This is really handy if we're, if we're trying to solve the problem we did before with this, uh, with this, um, sort of histogram thing that we wanted, right? And so we can actually now just say counter at answer is plus equal one, right? And we don't actually need all five lines here because as soon as we lazily access a key that we've never seen before, it's gonna run this block. And when it runs that block, it will set the value at K in the hash to zero. And then we can increment by one because we're adding and or we have encountered that key now. And so we're gonna like actually see that. Oops, uh, all right, let's see the demo. All right, so we get back the same exact result as we did before, but now in like much fewer lines of code or like, I don't know, three fewer lines of code. So, uh, but this can be this can be handy when you're trying to initialize uh, hashes and arrays. Arrays is same deal, right? You can say like, uh, I don't know, it's common to have like a 2D grid for a board. So you might have your board is array.new and then you wanna pass, or like f every time, um, or new also accepts an argument and that'll be like how many elements in the array. And then you can have a block that runs that will execute anytime a new element is created uh, when you're initializing the array. And so you can say like array.new nine or something like that. So that'll give you like a nine by nine board. Uh, that's just empty. Uh, so let's just take a look at that real quick. And so that's like a, an interesting way. That's hard to read. Let's make it uh, like two by two or something like that. All right. Um, 
cool. So now we have like this two by two array. Now, if we wanted something to be initialized in each of these elements, then we could again pass a block here that was just like, I don't know, like empty or something, right? Now, when, this, when, the, when the two elements of the inner array are initialized, it will execute this block and use the implicit return for whatever whatever is actually in here. So if we run this again, now we will see the string empty in all of these. So um, yeah, so that's kind of like some of the common use cases for blocks is lazily loading things, for iteration, for uh, passing around stuff. So hopefully, um, hopefully this is useful. Uh, and if not, maybe a little interesting. And uh, yeah, otherwise we'll see you next time.